you can unshare Erin, thank you. And we're now live, Anne Rita. Hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth seminar in our IDS series on inclusive trade. As we engage with academic debates, policy and practice on international trade and development outcomes, critically exploring the different dimensions of inclusion for trade, Today, we are excited to host our new speaker um, and our new discussant. Um, as we all know, the WTO Ministerial has been underway in Geneva this week with an extension until today. Hopes have been pinned on a fisheries deal aimed to end harmful subsidies, a TRIPS waiver that challenges um, and tries to deal with challenges with equitable access to vaccines as well as renewal of the customs moratorium and other issues. Yet the existence of the WTO has been questioned time and again. The, the dynamics of engaging in and with international trade has been changing. So now more than ever, it is really critical that we think of international trade as well as trade policy with an inclusive lens, considering its economic impacts along with critical environmental and social impacts. It is my pleasure today to welcome James Bacchus, founding member of the appellate body of the WTO, distinguished university professor of global affairs and director of the Center for Global Economic and Environmental Opportunity at the University of Central Florida. James is going to talk to us today about his most recent book, Trade Links, New Rules for a New World. How can trade links supported by a WTO trading system account for all the modern changes and challenges in the global economy. Joining us also is Emily Jones, Professor in Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government. She's a Specialist Advisor to the International Trade Select Committee in the UK Parliament and a co-founder of the Trade and Public Policy Network in the UK, which I'm fortunate to be a part of, and that seeks to foster engagement between academics and policymakers. So in store today, we have uh, a conversation on trade links. And without further ado, I'd like to invite James. Uh, James will present reflections from his book and Emily will provide a discussion to follow. Meanwhile, if you have questions, please do post them on the chat window. We will go into Q&A after uh, the speakers. Thank you very much, James, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Amrita. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you and uh, also, of course, uh, with Emily, whom I much admire. And uh, especially I'm honored to have been invited to uh, speak to the Institute of Development Studies. Uh, I look forward to being at the Institute to, in the fall so that we can work together on sustainable development. Um, as we speak, the members of the WTO are um, continuing to struggle in Geneva to try to conclude something, anything uh, from uh, their uh, long delayed and, and long anticipated ministerial conference. It, it is, at this point, <clears throat> unclear whether anything at all will be accomplished. Uh, there was hope in the uh, run-up to the conference uh, that uh, the members would conclude a, a, an agreement on which they've been negotiating for 20 years on needed disciplines for fisheries subsidies that can somehow uh, reduce the uh, fishing practices that uh, are contributing to unsustainable fish stocks. And now about a third of all the uh, fish uh, in the world. There was hope too that they would be able to uh, make a declaration uh, expressing opposition to the uh, proliferation of food export restrictions in the wake of uh, our climate, COVID, and now military conflict crisis that has uh, disrupted so many global food supply chains. 
there was the expectation as well that the members would extend the moratorium they have had in place since 1998 on uh, taxes, tariffs, uh, restrictions on electronic commerce. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, and Rita, there uh, was hope that this would be the time and place where the members of the WTO would include a, a, a waiver uh, to assist in the delivery of uh, essential COVID vaccines uh, to everyone in the world who is so much in need of them. There's a real risk that the members will conclude their uh, talks uh, today without concluding any of these things. This will only perpetuate the continuing existential crisis of the WTO. It will continue to push uh, the uh, international trade institution to the periphery and global trade uh, discussions and, and actions and it will undermine the continuing success of uh, the overall multilateral trading system. Now, those are the risks. Now, it's important to say to those who uh, think the WTO is of no purpose and is accomplishing nothing that uh, uh, first, uh, almost all of uh, the trade among the 164 member countries of the WTO that together account for 98% of all global commerce is conducted every day in virtually every way uh, in uh, a manner that is consistent with WTO rules. It's also important to note that uh, while there are very real uh, challenges facing the continued success of the WTO dispute settlement system, uh, which is really the core uh, of the uh, multilateral trading system, that nonetheless, uh, the system continues to function now and remains the most successful international dispute settlement system in the history of the world. Uh, as uh, some have said, uh, our glass at the WTO is half full, yeah, but I'm worried that uh, the content of glass is is uh, draining and especially given the fact that uh, not only do we seem unable to accomplish these goals that are on the WTO agenda this week, there's so much more that uh, the WTO should be doing that it's not doing at all. Uh, it should be noted that um, half of the members of the WTO have been discussing rules on digital trade for more than a year now. And they don't seem to have agreed on anything other than the fact that none of them like spam. Uh, it should also be pointed out that we've been negotiating for 20 years to try to eliminate the tariffs on environmental goods, something that's much needed now in terms of uh, spreading green technologies to the developing world. And there was no real effort made to conclude uh, those negotiations uh, at this ministerial conference. As I explain in my book, Trade Links, which talks about the connections between trade and pretty much everything else in the, in the world economy and in world ecology, um, there is uh, an inherited agenda that must be addressed. Uh, these, of course, are the issues that were on the agenda of the failed Doha development round, eliminating the remaining barriers to uh, trade and manufacturing, uh, trade and services, and trade in agriculture. Um, in agriculture, especially, it's important that developing countries be at last given the benefit of their uh, comparative advantage in producing agricultural products. Uh, this is something that they are currently denied because of trade distorting 
agricultural uh, subsidies, uh, largely among developed countries, including uh, my own country, the United States. There is also, as I explained in, in the book, um, a series of issues relating to uh, the 21st century commercial economy, issues that have largely arisen uh, uh, in the years since we established the WTO in 1995. And these issues include digital trade, uh, competition policy, um, investment facilitation, and intellectual property. Uh, on, on digital trade, for example, we have no WTO rules. How, how can we say that uh, we truly have uh, a multilateral trading system uh, in 2022 when we have no rules on digital trade? But the centerpiece of my thinking and where I think the WTO must focus if it is truly going to be successful and respond to the needs uh, in the world today is um, trade and its links to climate change and other dimensions economically, socially, and environmentally of sustainable development. Uh, if one were to look at the very first page of the Marrakesh Agreement that established the World Trade Organization uh, more than a quarter of a century ago, uh, one would see in the very first paragraph in the preamble to the uh, treaty, a shared commitment by the members of the WTO to pursue trade and economic endeavor in accordance with the objectives of sustainable development. This was written at the same time that uh, those uh, same countries were involved in negotiating the uh, agreements that emerged from the Earth Summit in Rio in 1992, something in which I was also involved while I was a member of the Congress of the United States. Those uh, agreements, of course, included the Rio Declaration on basic environmental principles and uh, also the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. It is no accident that the members of the WTO at that time placed sustainable development front and center in their uh, explanation of the purpose of the World Trade Organization. In the years since, I, I believe uh, WTO members have not really focused as they should and must on uh, the links between trade and sustainable development. Contrary to what some uh, say and believe, the WTO and WTO rules have generally not uh, posed any obstacles to sustainable development. There are some exceptions, but for the most part, uh, the operation of the system has uh, not been an impediment uh, to uh, the advance of um, sustainable development. And yet my belief is that um, the best way to keep that commitment made in 1995 at the origins of the system is to transform the system and uh, reimagine its rules in the ways that make the World Trade Organization an affirmative agent for achieving uh, climate change, including uh, uh, and achieving uh, sustainable development. Uh, the, the WTO must be working alongside other international institutions in uh, achieving the um, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Every single member of the WTO in its capacity as a member of the United Nations has embraced and affirmed its support 
for the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, in my view, as the appellate body said in uh, 1998, uh, in the opinion in what is generally called the shrimp turtle case, WTO rules must be seen through the prism of uh, the objectives of sustainable development. The preamble to the WTO treaty is a relevant context that must be considered in clarifying these rules wherever they are relevant to sustainable development. Moreover, of course, we need to revise some existing rules and write uh, new rules that are needed uh, to help address climate change and achieve sustainable development. I make many, many proposals in, in my uh, book, Trade Links, about how we should go about doing that. Um, uh, in respect to uh, climate change, I suggest that uh, the members begin by um, adopting a legal interpretation that uh, a carbon tax is uh, an indirect tax on a product that is eligible under the current rules for a border tax adjustment. This would eliminate any chilling effect that WTO rules may have in um, discouraging WTO members from engaging in carbon taxation. Uh, but as I explain, and as we see now in the European Union's proposed carbon border adjustment mechanism and in other similar mechanisms that are being prepared in other developed countries, um, because of the urgency of climate change, uh, I believe we must be willing to uh, permit under the WTO regime uh, certain national measures that restrict trade at the border for both uh, climate and competitiveness reasons. As it stands now, if these measures have uh, competitiveness motivations, they are highly unlikely uh, under the current rules to be eligible for the exceptions provided uh, in the rules for environmental measures. But climate change is one of uh, many uh, environmental issues we face at a time when the um, entire biosphere has at risk. Uh, Broadly speaking, my view is that we can no longer uh, think of um, the economy as being here and uh, the environment as being there. They are actually indivisible, one and the same. Indeed, uh, the economy is contained within the overall biosphere uh, and ecology of our imperiled planet. Uh, and our priority at this time must be protecting the planet. It must be uh, diminishing uh, harmful greenhouse gas emissions. It must uh, uh, be protecting our biodiversity. It must be promoting sustainable agriculture sustainable forest practices, sustainable mining, and much more. And in my book, I propose um, conditioning a lot of trade and products in those sectors uh, on sustainable production and sustainable practices. And now, as I stress in the book, and as I have stressed uh, since its publication in many places and on many occasions. Uh, while I feel it is urgent for WTO rules to permit uh, these kinds of uh, restrictions and conditions in trade in order to promote sustainability, uh, I believe it is unjust if we impose these restrictions on developing countries 
without also at the same time providing them with the financial assistance, the technical assistance, the technology transfer, uh, uh, and the training to be able to meet these new obligations. If we impose these kinds of restrictive obligations on the trade of developing countries and don't at the same time uh, make it possible for them to comply with these obligations, then what we're doing is simply uh, imposing green protectionism. And that is unjust. The uh, issue here is within, of course, a much broader agenda relating to the vast transition that's needed globally to a decarbonized world. Uh, and here I point to various uh, empirical uh, reports uh, showing that uh, developing countries uh, will need as much as $4 trillion in assistance to make that transition. Much of it will have to come from uh, the private sector and therefore governments must not only be increasing overseas development assistance, but also uh, being innovative in creating new ways where public private partnerships can provide um, additional uh, foreign direct investment and other kinds of monies that will assist developing countries in uh, becoming uh, more sustainable. As I explained too in the book, um, it's important to keep in mind at all times that the sustainable development goals and the concept of sustainable development and sustainable ability uh, do not relate solely to the environment. They also relate uh, to uh, many social and economic goals. Uh, the first of the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, is goal one uh, to end poverty. Certainly, we cannot end poverty unless we increase trade, including by lowering barriers to trade worldwide. Um, the restrictions we're talking about for climate reasons must not be allowed to uh, diminish the volume of trade, and they won't uh, if they are done in the right way and uh, with the right assistance to uh, developing countries. Uh, goal two is to end hunger. And of course, that's the reason why we need to have stronger um, WTO uh, uh, rules uh, to um, restrict these um, export food restrictions that are increasingly be imposed worldwide. Um, there are at last count more than 30 of them and uh, they are increasing if the members of the WTO do not take positive action in, in Geneva, that will only continue. Uh, yet another of the sustainable development goals re relates to health and, and well being. Uh, I, I am shocked that more than two years after the advent of the COVID pandemic, uh, members of the WTO have not concluded a medical trade agreement. I propose in my book uh, exactly how we should proceed in uh, creating such an agreement uh, by expanding the 1994 plurilateral pharma agreement to uh, include uh, much more trade in pharmaceuticals and uh, also trade in other medical goods. We need to free up that trade in order to um, uh, achieve our sustainable development goal for uh, the health of the people of the world. Uh, inclusively, uh, uh, we must also deal with issues of social inclusion. I'm pleased to say that the uh, members of the WTO have been focusing uh, increasingly and intensively on gender equity. And I'm hoping there will be some 
uh, positive results forthcoming from that effort. But I think too, we must do much more to uh, 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 make certain that trade is a benefit to uh, marginalized people of all kinds throughout the world. I speak in the book, for example, of the fact that there are 550 million indigenous peoples in the world. They do not often have genuine representation. They're often not connected to international trade. Uh, they need uh, much more of a voice in the world. They need um, to be connected to trade and, and they need to be in, connected in ways that do not undermine uh, their traditional sustainable uh, practices. Uh, we can learn a great deal from them. Um, the um, question may be asked, um, how is any of this possible politically? Uh, and, and especially how is it possible at a time when it seems that the WTO can uh, not conclude anything. Well, I am not uh, solely, at least, a starry-eyed idealist. Uh, I am a, a practical um, practitioner of public policy. Uh, I have been uh, trying to make things happen uh, on trade and sustainable development for a number of decades now. Many of the things in, that uh, uh, I've been uh, a participant in, many of the initiatives uh, in which I've been engaged along with many others have been um, starry-eyed ideas that uh, people told us at the time were impossible. We were told in the 1980s and in the early 1990s when I was in the Congress and, and working um, to conclude the Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations that it was really impossible to create uh, an international trade institution, much less a binding international trade dispute settlement system. When I was a, a very young and uh, a trade negotiator for the United States, uh, um, I was among those who first advanced uh, the notion of, of what ultimately became the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, we were told by our colleagues that that would never happen. Um, I am someone who believes we have a duty of optimism. I am a follower of Karl Popper, for those who are familiar with his uh, work on open societies. Uh, open societies, in my view, must include an openness to trade and other forms of commerce. Um, so uh, I think that despite the challenges we clearly confront, and despite how imposing they seem to be, uh, we have a duty still of being optimistic. And here I point out that um, there are 73 WTO members who are working now on structured discussions on a lot of these issues relating to sustainable development. Uh, these are the uh, structured discussions on uh, the relationship between trade and environmental sustainability. They're talking about uh, subsidies. Well, we should eliminate uh, fossil fuel subsidies, especially on production and perhaps over time on consumption. They are pernicious, the opposite of what we should be doing. Uh, they are beginning to talk about uh, the need for a circular economy, for circular trade. In the last statistics, I saw only about 8.4% of all world trade is circular, is circular. The members of the uh, WTO are actively engaged in uh, working alongside uh, the United Nations to uh, conclude uh, commercially 
some parallel rules on plastics pollution uh, that would um, complement, be aligned with and reinforce what we hope will be a United Nations agreement on plastics pollution. There's so much more we could do there. These 73 members are uh, determined to conclude these environmental goods agreements to eliminate these barriers to trade in environmental goods. And quite uh, importantly, they also want to expand that effort to include uh, trade and environmental services, which increasingly are linked with trade and environmental goods. Uh, and much more uh, is on their agenda. I'm hoping that these negotiations uh, will become truly and formally actual negotiations and will lead to real rule making by the members of the WTO. Should this uh, ministerial conference conclude with nothing having been achieved, uh, certainly that will be a failure uh, by WTO members, but it will not be the end of the multilateral trading system. It will continue. And uh, I believe we need con to continue uh, to uh, give every priority we can, especially uh, given uh, climate change, COVID and the military conflict we now have in Ukraine uh, to trade multilateralism, as well as other forms of international cooperation multilaterally. Uh, I refuse to give up. And uh, I am pleased that uh, in refusing to give up, I have uh, uh, so many uh, uh, fellow travelers uh, so many colleagues in so many places, including uh, the University of Sussex, uh, who, like me, are uh, uh, trying to create a willing world. Uh, thank you so very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. I, I can promise a reply. I can't re promise an answer. I shall do my best. Thank you, Amber. Thank you so much, uh, James. I think as we wait, you know, in the next hour or so to hear from the from the WTO ministerial conference, I think you've given us really critical messages for inclusion for climate change. We need to do much more for trade to benefit the march importantly, the most marginalized. And how will this actually be possible? So, without saying more, I'd like to now invite Professor Emily Jones as she's going to provide some reflections on, on your uh, book. Emily, over to you. Thank you much, very much, uh, Amrita, and thank you, Jim. What a fascinating book, and I have to say, I've read it pretty much at speed since yesterday, and I've enjoyed it. And it's a real whirlwind tour of so many of the debates in global trade, so I really highly recommend it um, to everyone. And so much food for thought. It's really, it's, I think, an opportunity for all of us to really think back or step back and really think about what is it that we want from the trading system. Um, and the environmental imperative absolutely front and foremost. And is it delivering and how might we reform it? So very much share that spirit of optimism, um, Jim. There's a huge amount in the book to commend um, and I really enjoyed it. And I think you, the first part there, you really remind us of the follies of our autarky um, and the problems associated with protectionism and it's well-trodden ground, but again, it needed to be reminded of, I think all of us um, in the, given the fast, first few, uh, the last few years. And I was particularly impressed with, and I really enjoyed the really thoughtful analysis of all um, the environmental aspects, not only climate change, but biodiversity, circular economy, um, plastics. Um, and you make some really powerful arguments, I think, for reforming uh, trade rules there. So I've got four areas that I wanted to flesh out a little bit and perhaps push, um, push you on, um, open up some areas for discussion. Um, so these are the areas perhaps that we, we might focus on in the in the discussion. But the first one I wanted to draw attention to is just the question about um, what we've what we see free trade in. And you talk a lot about the gains from openness and the gains from trade. And I wanted to ask you um, in the area of labor, because there's not much on labor mobility and movement of low skilled um, people across the world. And clearly that's a, an area where we could have huge economic gains 
it's politically toxic, it's politically a very difficult place to go, but I would love to hear your reflections on just labor mobility um, in the global economy. And the second one was around innovation, ideas, and intellectual property, which you do touch on um, in the book. And you mentioned in several places the need for much greater technology transfer and that developed countries, industrialized countries have sort of reneged on that commitment over time. Um, and I guess within the space of sort of allowing ideas to freely flow around the world, you do grapple with this challenge of intellectual property. And I guess the question there is if we struck the right balance, I'd like to put you on intellectual property rules. Cognizant at the moment of the big ongoing debate about the TRIPS waiver in the context of COVID vaccines. Um, but I think, I think it does raise this question of while well, we want to reward innovation, at the moment have we created opportunities for rent seeking? And we, do we have an intellectual property regime that dampens that transfer of technology and ideas around the world? Um, and if sort of how might we distribute that production of frontier technologies in particular? And I think for many developing countries, the fact they've been so de dependent on reliant of vaccines from elsewhere has really brought to this, the front this question of we don't have local or regional capacity in a key area. You know, do you need, you, you, it's very tough if you're import dependent. Um, so just this question of how do we distribute um, manufacturing in vaccines, in health technologies, but also in green technologies. Are we not sort of setting ourselves up for a similar challenge where we've got intellectual property rules that don't necessarily enable that diffusion of green technologies around the world that we so vitally need? So I wanted to push you a little bit on that question of where we've perhaps got impediments and whether the intellectual property system is indeed some form of impediment. Um, the second area I wanted to touch on a little bit was competition and tax. So you mentioned competition, and I just wondered, particularly in the digital economy at the moment, whether this is an area where we do need um, a lot more attention. And as you rightly say in the book, at the moment, we've really got a global trading system that's looked at um, distortions in markets that have come from government subsidies and government intervention. But I guess the question I have is thinking about the digital economy, the network effects, whether actually we're in a position now where we need international cooperation on uh, market concentration, particularly in the technology sector. You could argue similarly, we've seen um, greater market concentration in um, pharmaceuticals, uh, <laughs> We see it in food and global agricultural markets. We certainly see it in the financial services sector. And traditionally, again, that's been something we've looked at only domestically. So we've sort of seen domestic um, as the space for competition enforcement and whether actually at the moment we, we, it is a juncture in time where we need to start rethinking that question of market co um, concentration and international rules in that space. And similarly, the corporate tax agenda, which I think is a really interesting one. Because um, you rightly say a lot of people have become disillusioned with globalization. There's a real perception, OECD countries at least, of the sort of the system being rigged. And again, the tax system we've seen as a national prerogative, so it should be done nationally. But as multinationals have expanded globally, and again, particularly in the digital space, it's becoming easier and easier for corporate tax avoidance. And we've seen now these very tentative moves in the last year under the OECD ne negotiations to start having some kind of rules on global corporate tax. And I don't think it's an issue for the trading system, but I do think unless we've got sort of stronger rules in some of these areas, it's very hard to get populations to agree with op an open economy. So unless we can sort of move in tandem with stronger rules, I think on uh, market power and corporate concentration and corporate tax, then it's harder to get populations to come along board alongside um, open markets and the, the trading system. So I think it's something that trade negotiators should perhaps be um, aware of and thinking about. And the third area was then this sort of the quality of trade debate, which you bring up really effectively in the environmental chapters. I think you just mentioned there as you were presenting this notion of the WTO as an affirmative agent, really trying to help us transition to a just green economy. Um, and I guess that begs the question of where exactly we draw the line between allowing governments to step in and really actively distort markets in the interests of um, the environment. And when is that disguised protectionism? And I think that's the really interesting um, frontier, if you like, that we're going to have to to grapple with, because it, we've 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 seen. I think we've got the imperative now to support governments to act, and I understand fully the argument for a climate waiver, and I'm very much supportive of it. But at what point and how do we judge when that's distortive, protectionist, um, and problematic? And I think that's a really interesting area where we should start digging into. And my final comments were just on the digital space. Um, which again you mention in, in the book and something that I've been looking at. And I think in a, another area where actually we're going to need an affirmative set of trade rules as opposed to just an open set of trade rules that's really premised around openness. 
And you mention in the book the need for, for trade rules that enable data to flow across borders, which again, I think is right and very important. But again, I think if we're not, if we're not then paying attention to the, the concentration in digital markets and addressing the competition issues, if we're not thinking about data privacy standards, data protection, if we're not thinking about labor rights in the gig economy, um, in an international way, I think we're, we're setting ourselves up for, for failure. Um, so just to give you one example on the labor rights space, we're seeing more and more people that would have been in the informal economy engaging in gig economy work and being employed by platforms actually that are in, based in other jurisdictions. So it's going to be very hard to address labor and labor standards at a national level. And again, without some kind of minimum standards, I think we'll, we'll, we'll not see the citizens sort of come behind and open trading system. So I wonder well, as I wonder whether this lens you give us, I think it's a super helpful one in the environmental space of the WTO as an affirmative agent, whether actually the, that's the lens we could usefully look at digital labor and other issues as well. But thank you very much. I really commend the book to everybody. And I think it's a great, great book for stepping back and really thinking about the global trading system as it stands and how we need and want it to be in the future. Thanks so much, um, Emily. Uh, in the in the interest of time, uh, Jim, if if that's okay with you, I'd like to add a couple of audience questions, and I'll of, sub of course. I'll of try to summarize. Um, I'll, and I'll also, try to remember all these things. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because there are some similar asks, and I'd like to cheekily also uh, add my question if that's okay. So, of course. You know, uh, as we can see from your presentation, from the ongoing discussions, there are multiple asks for the trading system at the minute. And I wonder really, and that would be sort of a, a driving home <laughs> moment almost, is that, you know, what would be the true two critical messages, really, the two messages that, you know, you'd like to say that, you know, the WTO needs to um, work towards to foster more inclusion, but be, be mindful of climate change, you know, biodiversity and sustainable goals. And not to put you on the spot again, but we do ask this question of, all speakers. Um, or from the audience, um, Emily Lidgate, Evertian, um, or from Sussex have asked, you know, do you see any incompatibility between economic growth and planetary boundaries? You also said in your presentation that, of course, um, one, one way could be to um, have conditionalities but not impose them. Uh, but provide support and training to least developed countries? Are there lessons learned from aid for trade there? Um, and yeah, and so really those are the three questions, you know, what are the two main messages and, and do you see any sort of incompatibility and what are the lessons? Over to you, James, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, these are all great questions. Uh, had, uh, I written another 100 pages in the book, I would have uh, done more to address each of them. Uh, but my one of my goals was to keep the book short enough uh, so that it'd be affordable. I, I, I achieved that. Uh, as I've done in my previous uh, work, um, I'm already beginning to write uh, papers uh, expanding on some of the ideas that are in trade links. Uh, many of the chapters in trade links uh, emerge from some of my previous uh, work. Um, uh, let me say, first of all, uh, that I agreed with every word Emily said. Um, let me see if I can elaborate a little bit on the points she made uh, from my perspective. Uh, first of all, um, when I was in the Congress of the United States uh, 30 years ago, I was an advocate for um, linking trade to core labor standards under the um, agreements of the International Labor Organization. Um, I didn't have a chapter on this in trade links, but it's very much part of what I think we need to do in terms of uh, using trade affirmatively uh, to achieve uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, I still think we need to do that. Uh, on the intellectual property issue, and especially on the balance in the TRIPS agreement, the intellectual property treaty, as a, a jurist who has uh, delved into these issues 
in WTO appeals in the past. Uh, it's my view that the uh, balance expressed by the members in Articles 7 and 8 of the TRIPS Agreement uh, between innovation and access uh, is uh, quite a good balance. Indeed, I just published a paper on this, uh, um, which I believe came out after uh, this book was published. Yeah. I've been somewhat surprised that the developing countries have gone to such lengths to secure uh, permission for compulsory licensing uh, in these current negotiations. In my view, they already have permission for compulsory licensing uh, un under Article 7 and especially 8 of the TRIPS Agreement. And I cannot imagine any WTO jurists saying otherwise. I suppose they want the added oomph of um, uh, uh, agreement from uh, the development countries that this is so, but I think they have that right already under the, the WTO rules. Uh, as I have looked at the COVID vaccine issue, and as I have written over and over against the uh, evils of vaccine nationalism, I have seen this issue largely as one of production. So and production capacity. So I think Emily is absolutely right. And in here, part of what we need to be doing in providing uh, financial and technical assistance to developing countries is enabling them to develop their public health uh, infrastructure, uh, develop production facilities, especially for some of these new uh, uh, vaccines uh, uh, that are needed to counter pandemics. COVID will not be the last pandemic. Uh, and uh, also they need uh, a great deal of additional human capital to enable them to uh, uh, produce these kinds of vaccines. And there, I think there is ample room for public-private partnerships uh, that can achieve this. And I have thought that this should be the focus of the WTO negotiations. And of course, that these negotiations should be coupled with uh, uh, the provision of, of financing through other international uh, financial institutions. Uh, on the issue of competition policy, absolutely. I think we need to focus on market concentration. I, I think that needs to be done domestically in my country in a departure from what I think has been the wrong headed uh, approach to what we Americans call antitrust policy over the past several decades. And internationally, I think we've uh, reached a point where it's necessary to have competition rules. Uh, to some extent, uh, in some respect, we have them informed of trade remedies rules. These are behind the border competition rules relating to dumping subsidies, safeguard measures. But I think we need more and I think the uh, um, top of the list in uh, negotiating competition rules should be issues of market concentration. I uh, uh, therefore I agree with what the uh, European Union said in 1996 at the WTO ministerial conference in Singapore. We need competition rules within the WTO. On uh, the tax issue, I support the efforts uh, that have been led in particular by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen of the United States uh, uh, within the OECD uh, and beyond you know, to uh, establish some different basic rules for corporate taxation worldwide. I agree that this should not be done uh, within the WTO. Um, the WTO should continue to deal with uh, the application of taxes as they affect trade, but uh, the uh, level of taxation, uh, I think, should be uh, dealt with separately through international cooperation and agreement. 
Um, I take also Emily's point about uh, the need for line drawing at the frontier we see where um, increasingly trade restrictions are contemplated for climate and other sustainability reasons. This is truly the frontier. And um, as climate change and other ecological crises worsen, uh, it, it will uh, move to the center of trade discussions internationally, uh, I predict. Um, and it is a line drawing exercise. In my proposal for a WTO climate waiver, I've set out uh, how I would draw the lines. I won't rehearse that in detail here now, but this is only a proposal. Uh, the lines might be joined a little differently. Uh, I have made a proposal that I think would protect us uh, against what would essentially be a green protectionism while also uh, providing for affirmative climate action. Um, in, not in trade links, but in my um, previous book, The Willing World, I, uh, I talk a lot about drawing the line in between, uh, quoting Lord Macaulay uh, from a few years ago. And I think that's the challenge uh, of trade negotiation is, is the challenge of uh, trade adjudication to uh, draw the line uh, in negotiation and then uh, clarify uh, the line in adjudication. But where you draw the line is very important. On the digital issue, <clears throat> uh, Emily, I have, um, In addition to uh, uh, the thoughts I've expressed on digital trade and trade links, uh, recently published a, a lengthy paper uh, for CG in Canada that is online. Uh, the title is The Digital Decide. And in it, I do my best to lay out uh, issue by issue what I think should be included in a WTO digital trade agreement. Um, and Rita, in terms of um, your question, uh, uh, my answer as to what the WTO should do, my, my soundbite, if you will, uh, is to, the WTO needs to um, put sustainable development at the center of all it does in a way that will maximize uh, climate and sustainability action while minimizing uh, the risk to the trading system and continuing to liberate trade in a sustainable way. Uh, on the two questions that were asked uh, by viewers, which I greatly appreciate, as I explained in my book, The Willing World, and as I echo in trade links, I feel that um, economic growth must be sustainable growth. I do not believe that we can measure growth uh, merely by GDP. Uh, if I have a million dollars and uh, the 10 other people where I live all have $1, the average is pretty good but the reality of inequality uh, shows otherwise. In addition to being a, a follower of Karl Popper, I'm also a follower of Amartya Sen. And I support, I support his concept of sustainable freedom and of the need to promote human flourishing by promoting sustainable freedom. And the measure that I would use for growth is one that um, uh, tries to quantify human flourishing in some of the same ways as the Human Development Report does annually. And I think this must uh, clearly take into account planetary boundaries. Um, the um, 
SDGs do not mention planetary boundaries. I should add also, they do not mention human rights. But I think those two concepts are implicit in between the lines of all the SDGs. And uh, they have to be in mind in everything that we do. And Rita on aid to trade, uh, I think the Europeans are setting a, a good example for the world. Uh, obviously, aid to trade needs to be multiplied everywhere in the world by developed countries and needs to be increased by the European Union as well. That said, uh, the last statistics I sh saw uh, showed that 43% of all aid for trade in the world is provided by the European Union. Uh, so um, I would perhaps point my finger elsewhere, <laughs> including at my own country, which has done far too little in aid for trade. And uh, if one looks at the uh, content of the European aid for trade, um, an increasing part of it is tied to sustainable development. Um, I think this is likely to be enhanced through the EU's Green Deal, uh, which I applaud, uh, but much more needs to be done. Generally, I should say the uh, European Union's Green Deal is in very many ways consistent with a lot of what I have proposed uh, in trade links. I think I've addressed all the questions that were raised. I'm happy to address more from our viewers. I think that's great, uh, James. Yes, in fact, you have uh, managed to cover all the questions and actually we are up to the hour, so we have run out of time. Um, I'm sure there'll be opportunities for um, you know, interacting with you again for us at Sussex and we look forward to hosting you uh, in the near future. Thank you for all those really important messages. And, you know, we have our fingers crossed and looking at the outcome for the ministerial. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everybody who was able to join us. Um, thanks, everyone. My great yes. pleasure. Thank you all. And I will see you in September. See you soon. Thanks. Thank you. See you.